Thank you. Um, so good morning, welcome, um, and uh, we're very fortunate to be able to continue this wonderful um, forum. Um, and so, of course, naturally through the commitment and generosity of GEMS Education and GEMS Foundation and our other distinguished sponsors, we thank them very much. So the subject of our discussion is private education and its role in a knowledge-based society. So where do we begin? To open this session, we can definitely make some credible assumptions. A couple of simple ones are that we all agree that education sector globally adds to the economic prosperity and secure future of a nation. We can also agree that despite Millennium Development Goal number two of universal primary education for all children in the world by 2015, we've fallen far short of this goal and are unlikely to ever reach it with the continuation of present policies. So what then needs to be changed and what practices should we adopt to ensure that there can be realization of education for all children, including the world's poorest? Where does the private sector figure into all of this? So during this hour, we're going to examine the increasing demand for and growth of private sector education, the debate surrounding it, and the question of investment in education as a for-profit model that ensures sustainability of the delivery of education as opposed to aid-based models. I'd like to introduce our four panelists, each of whom have embraced or examined private sector education in distinctly different ways that cover a wide spectrum of socioeconomic environments. To my left is Gabriel Salgren. He is the Director of Research at the Center for Market Reform of Education in the United Kingdom. He's also a research fellow at the Institute of Economic Affairs and has been active at several European and US think tanks. Gabriel's the author of the paper, Schooling for Money, and a newly published book, Incentivizing Excellence, which I think you all saw a copy of this morning on your screen. Um, in this book, he, he, his research findings indicate that there's really no robust evidence that fee paying, per se, makes a difference to education quality. So his focus is really on the whole question of fee paying. Um, Next to him, I think he needs absolutely no introduction, is Dino Varki, the Group Chief Operating Officer and Board Member of GEMS Education. Dino spearheads the global strategic development of GEMS Foundation. Today, GEMS Education is the largest privately held kindergarten through 12 education in the world and looks to fulfill its mission to be the world's leading provider of quality education. Next to um, Dino is Jay Kimmelman, Kimmelman, who operates in an entirely different market, targeting some of the world's poorest communities. He has been operating chiefly in Kenya. Um, he really learned his lessons from the hundreds of thousands of other low-cost school, private school operators. And really, based on the pioneering research of Professor James Tooley on the subject of chain schools serving the very poor, has now established the largest number of for-profit chain schools in sub-Saharan Africa, with 134 schools serving 50,000 students. Um, and then to my far left is uh, Biju Mohandas, Head of Health and Education for Sub-Saharan Africa at the International Finance Corporation. That through a large loans and finances and provides advice for private initiatives of the World Bank in the developing world. He has several years of operating and investing experience across multiple emerging markets in India and Africa. So gentlemen, we welcome you and we look forward to a fruitful discussion while we examine the place 
if any, for private sector participation in education. In every other walk of life, we've adopted private sector principles. Yet when private sector is mentioned in the context of education, particularly for the most economically disadvantaged, there's usually an outcry of indignation. And even in higher socioeconomic brackets, th there is still a stigma attached to this. So why is this? What causes this stigma? And is there research and models that demonstrate a counterpoint to this perception? What does for profit in education really mean? What are the advantages and what are the dangers and caveats? These are some of the questions that I would like our distinguished panelists and audience to consider today and share their experiences with us in an interactive way with you. We welcome the questions from the audience and we hope that we will really be able to have a meaningful and interactive discussion. So Salzan, I'd like to begin with you and ask you to briefly summarize your position um, and I'm going to ask our panelists to keep their initial remarks short to allow plenty of time for questions and answers from the audience and panelists. So go uh, ahead, Salzan. Yes. Um, so yes, the research which is presented in a book that you should be given an advanced copy of, uh, as you noted, uh, it doesn't really uh, say anything, or it doesn't say, state clearly at least, that fee paying per se makes a difference in terms of producing higher education quality. Uh, the evidence say is kind of dated and it suffers from somewhat mo some methodological problems. And my conclusion from this in general is a, it's a some, you know, it's not a strong conclusion, but it seems to matter little who pays for the education. Um, but, you know, there's every reason to invest in private and uh, public partnerships, uh, for example, through voucher schemes, but whether the, you know, there has to be a fee paying element in this uh, scheme uh, is not clear to me. But I think it's very important to not confuse fee paying with the, the question of profit. Um, the profit motive can play a significant role in uh, promoting higher education quality, uh, whether these schools are privately or publicly funded. Um, the evidence in general does not suggest that privately, sorry, I mean commercial uh, schools are necessarily better than non-profit schools. They seem to be on par. That's not the issue. Um, the issue is that the for-profit schools tend to scale up uh, in response to demand. Uh, and uh, this, is the, this is simple, you know, the reason why is because they have strong incentive to do so. The non-profit schools, on the other hand, often tend to be quite small, they tend to be local, and this is what, I mean, in my country, Sweden, we have a universal voucher scheme uh, with uh, both for-profit and non-profit schools, but we see that the for-profit schools, they scale up to demand, non-profit schools stay small, local, and both without the waiting uh, 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 line, in fact. Um, so uh, the key issue is that I think that for-profit schools will ensure that more competition uh, incre I mean, competition increases in the system, which in turn will uh, be able to rise uh, or raise education, uh, educational achievement uh, across the system, not only in the for-profit schools. This is indeed what the academic research shows from PISA, uh, which establishes that a higher percentage of the pupils in private schools in any given system increases PISA achievement significantly and reduces costs as well. Um, and again, I think it was important yesterday when we talked about how can we scale up this, the, the things that work in education. And I think the profit can be an immensely uh, uh, important mechanism, uh, which has been very difficult to find. Uh, you know, if the best schools uh, are in demand, the for-profit schools will ensure to scale up their excellence <coughs> in order to meet that demand. And the result is not only more competition, uh, but that more pupils will have, have opportunities to attend the best possible schools. Uh, so, in essence, why I argue that, you know, if for education markets to work, uh, we need as a strong supply side dynamic to, to ensure that pupils can attend the best schools, and this can only be produced, I argue, with uh, a for-profit provision. Thank you. <coughs> so really, Salzen, what you're talking about is, is, is a higher socioeconomic level, and you're talking about for-profit schools scaling up. Um, as opposed to, well, no, I'd, I'd just like to ask if you could clarify one yeah. point. Why do you say that smaller, that not-for-profit schools do not tend to scale up? 
Yeah, there are two reasons why, uh, because this has been the issue in both in Chile and in Sweden, in mo many voucher systems. Uh, and you will, I mean, there's only two universal voucher systems that allow for partnerships in Sweden and Chile. Um, well, there are two reasons. First of all, the incentive is, is not really there. You can, if you want to make money, you have an incentive to save up. Um, secondly, it's very difficult to find capital. For-profit schools can target investors and say, okay, in, you know, in exchange for future potential profits, we want you to invest so you can build a new school in, in, in these communities. Non-profit schools are very, very much more uh, difficult to, to find that capital. So there are two reasons for it. I think it's an incentive issue and also um, uh, a capital issue. I think from our perspective, again, I'm very proud to say that for a third generation education family, we have been educating and had the privilege of educating students for over 54 years. And for all that time, we have done it as a for-profit private sector model. From my perspective, though, regardless of the private sector conversation, I think it is important for us to understand the scale of the challenge. If we look at, and I, it's been alluded to on multiple sessions that we've been in already, uh, we've talked about uh, the fact that we are unlikely to meet uh, the Millennium Development Goal 2 mark, which is universal access to primary education. And that number stands at anywhere between 61 to 70 million. If you were to extend that and actually look at the number of young people that are forced to opt out of secondary education, or those children who may not have a teacher standing in front of them of any quality forcing administrators to put together class sizes of 70 or 80. If we were to extend that definition even further and consider the 800 million young people and young adults that are illiterate today, add to that the accelerating population growth dynamics that we see in emerging markets. When you start to propose a definition of access to education that isn't just about access but also access to quality, then the gap that we're looking at trying to overcome extends to well over a billion people and accelerating away from us. So in this kind of context, what we typically tend to say is, is governments on their own <coughs> cannot fund this demand. Governments on their own cannot move fast enough to meet this demand. So from our perspective, it becomes increasingly apparent that either private sector will step in outright in order to cater to the ambition and aspiration of communities around the world or in partnership with governments. And we really don't have to look very far in order to forecast the potential growth of private sector in education. Just look at the growth of private sector in healthcare over the last 40 years. That is the best sector to look at in order to forecast the journey that we all need to embark on in order to address the scale of the challenge. So, um, Dino, <coughs> when, you're, when you were talking about the place for private education, are you only referring to the for-profit model or are you also embracing public schools? When you were, when you were talking about the 70 depends on whose inaccurate figures you want to believe. <laughs> um, what do you really think that a for-profit model is the only model that can uh, actually work in the private sector? So, so from our perspective, we have both. Uh, I think one of the things that we're very proud of, uh, and I have somebody sitting to my left that's going to blow me out of the water when he talks about what he does, but before he has a chance to speak, let me get my, my two cents in. I think we're very proud of the fact that since our inception, we've really focused on the community. So we've actually uh, tried to create an education model that suits the ambition and aspiration of communities of different socioeconomic sectors. So today, we have for-profit private schools that you would expect to see that are 20, 25, $30,000 a year, but we also have private schools at $750 a year. The thing that makes us tick and the reason why uh, people that endorse us think of us as a model of success is because we're able to deliver a consistent level of student outcomes, qualifications, and values. So 
to give an example, we're able to send a student to MIT from a $1,000 a year school just as we are a $40,000 a year school. However, we are not naive. We know that even at $750 a year, there are hundreds of millions of children that cannot access that kind of education. So from our perspective, what we've tried to do, because we still haven't figured out how to do policy at a lower price point just yet, is our foundation. And from our perspective, our foundation is, is our attempt at trying to, to address uh, the access to quality education point uh, at the basic pyramid. And there, it isn't about the financial resources that we can bring to bear, but actually the intellectual property that we've built over the last 50 full years that we can then use in developing markets. So for instance, we train um, 10,000 school principals in Ghana, Kenya, and India using our leadership development program. If we get that program right, then that potentially has the ability to improve educational outcomes for 10 million children. So that's our nonprofit side. But I'm sure as we get to Jay, he's going to challenge some of what I've said. So. But you, so really from the foundation's point of view, what you're delivering is more education service in the system. Yeah. Go ahead, Jay. Um, we think that it's about choice, and it's about choice not just for people who have a lot of money, but for people who have less money, for people who live in poverty, and they have no less right to choose where they send their children to school than, they, than families who earn a lot of money do. And so for us, it's about um, providing choice at that bottom of the pyramid. So we charge about five US dollars per child per month, which means in the communities where we work, the poorest communities in Kenya, in the urban slums, and poor <coughs> towns and villages, 90% of families can afford to pay unassisted our school fees. So this is a, it's a very different way of looking at private sector involvement in education. It's not private sector uh, at the middle income or the wealthy, but it's actually private sector at the bottom. Um, <coughs> and we think that's where a lot of this movement needs to go, because that's where there are 700 million children who don't currently have access to a quality, affordable education. There was a question about what about all, of, why, is it, why is the private sector, why are the existing schools small scale you mentioned earlier? And is that good, is that bad, and what do we do about it? Um, for us, the issue is about can you invest in the right educational ecosystem? Can you provide schools with the right teacher training, the curriculum, the, uh, the monitoring, the assessment, the technology, all the things that we know go towards creating a high quality learning environment? Um, one of the reasons why we are a chain of schools, so we're 134 schools teaching about 50,000 people, um, is so that we as a company can invest significant sums of money in curriculum, teacher training, technology, monitoring, assessment, quality assurance, which are very difficult to do as a small scale sole proprietorship. Um, as a result of all of that, we're able to deliver very high quality outcomes. So our pupils outperform on international exams by around 200% in six months because you're able to provide that ecosystem. Um, and the market, if you're looking at trying to attract uh, private sector capital and private sector interest, the market at the, the bottom of the pyramid is tremendous. Um, we're opening up one new school every three calendar days right now, and that's just in Kenya. We're expanding outside. Um, there's an enormous demand for our families for quality offerings that they can afford. And so we think that's the next frontier of private sector um, involvement in education, particularly in emerging economies. So, Jay, who owns these <coughs> schools? We do. Your company owns the schools? Yeah, they're, they're, they're operated all exclusively by members of the local community, and we define local as hyper-local. So every one of our teaching staff, every one of our principals, who we call academy managers, walk to the school. They live within 500 meters of the school building, but we are a chain of schools. But who what I, the question I'm just trying to get at was, is who actually manages the school? Is it a local school management committee, or wh where is the governance provided? So our academies are run by an academy manager who comes from a local community, who's trained by us, who uses our smartphones and uses our processes and systems, has our quality assurance and monitoring, our call center support. Um, they are a member of the local community, but uh, the governance obviously comes through our company to ensure that we have standardized quality across you know, 1,500 classrooms at any one moment. Um, Obviously, we follow local regulation, the National Regulation Act as, as a school, um, but the management of the school is, is the company, but our stakeholder is the parent. So we are 100% accountable to every one of our parents, more so than almost any other school in the community. Parents are paying school fees, albeit small school fees, 
still significant enough that if a parent is uh, unhappy with what we provide, that's the most important thing to us. So we are completely accountable to the local community. The flip side is what typically happens is they're very excited and that allows us to scale and grow. Um, but we are accountable to our local community in ways that the vast majority of schools in our context are not. Sir, it, I just wanted to clarify <coughs> something. Sir, this is a, I, I noticed in, in a lot of the literature that you um, receive uh, venture capital contributions. So does it help you to, to fund all of the necessary programming, teacher training, and getting the whole infrastructure up to, to speed. At what point um, would you see, as you add all of these schools, one after the other, your break-even point? Where does it become sustainable? It, how does that model, how do you prove that model as having sustainability? So the schools themselves are profitable in the first year. Overall, to recoup the investments in the large-scale operations and systems and investments we make, we need to reach hundreds of thousands of people. The reality, though, as everyone said by putting this, this, the statistics out there, is that's just a drop in the bucket. There are 700 million kids around the world who are primary school age who live in families earning less than $2 a day. I mean, so scale is not the problem in this market. And so, you know, in terms of bringing in large-scale investment capital who, uh, into models that require scale like ours, this, the, there is not a fear of reaching scale from a market demand side. I mean, we open a new, up a new school, and on average, within eight days of opening a new school, there's 350 people there in line. We opened up 51 schools eight weeks ago because of the demand. So there isn't, you know, the scale out there in the market is huge. It's about do you have the right systems, people, tools, processes, technology, curriculum in order to reach that scale? And that's what we've been, you know, working on and perfecting over the last couple of years. What is the feeling in the community by the people that have already started schools? Um, and how does the government also feel about what you're doing? Because, you know, having worked in this area myself, um, I know that there are tremendous efforts by uh, the poor members of the community themselves to try and solve this issue. Um, and there's also quite often a lot of um, annoyance by government to watch the private sector take matters into their own hands. I was just wondering what your experience is and why you think that is. Funny story. <laughs> we, um, when, we, when we enter a new market, we're typically uh, less, more affordable than 65% of the low-cost private schools in the market. So we come in at a very... Um, very affordable compared to the alternatives that exist. But as you said, there are lots of alternatives. I mean, on average, in, in an urban setting, we work both urban and rural, but in an urban setting, 55% of the children are already going to private schools. So, you know, that exists well before grades. So there are a lot of, of, of schools out there. Um, again, we think it's about choice. So we come in, we provide an extremely high quality and very affordable option. So children, you know, come to us from out of school, from other private schools, from the government school, um, and, you know, that can be viewed both positively and negatively, and it's just like any other market in any other business. There's competition, and, you know, we are, uh, we are a good member of the community, but that obviously with some issues do arise with that, but we're always from the local community. Our teachers, our staff, our academy managers, we're not a foreign body coming into the community. We are fully immersed in that community, and so that pretty much diffuses the vast majority of funding. Um, Vis-a-vis -vis the government, um, it, we're, we're fortunate to work um, right now in Kenya where the government has recognized the existence of this low-cost private school market. There are thousands upon thousands of low-cost private schools that have nothing to do with grades. We, we're the largest chain in Africa, but there are thousands and thousands of schools. Um, so the government has recognized the need for and the existence of, and they're working on, and we're working with them, um, on how do they create the right enabling and regulatory environment. And at the, um, at the most senior levels of government, they're extremely concerned because they see, uh, they see the growth in the population, they see the, the, the resources available for building schools, um, and they realize that they need to partner and we need to partner with them in order to solve the problem collectively. And in many ways, um, we are a fantastic pilot program for the government. So we educate a child to something 
uh, approximately about a fifth of what it costs the government to educate a child. That means that every single thing that we do, every single result we get, can be mimicked by the government. When the government uh, looks with a, at a high-end <coughs> private school, um, there are things that they can't mimic because of the actual dollars and, or, or shillings involved. Every single thing we do at, at Bridge International Academy can be done by the government. So in many ways, there's you know, fantastic opportunity for partnership uh, of learning in both directions. Finance Corporation and some of your experiences in Africa and India uh, as you've been. Um, I, I know that you deal with health, but perhaps there are some uh, parallels that you could also draw from the health sector. Sure, I, I deal with both health and education, so um, I ha I'm happy to comment on that. So from, from our perspective, a few of the points have already been made in far more articulate fashion, but just to summarize, a, the scale is just too huge, um, and it's, it's just increasing. So the question of public, private, um, you know, you need both. Um, private, um, in, in some ways, it's also a moot point because private sector is already there. R depending on which countries you're talking about, it's anywhere from 30 to 60%. Um, and that is when you talk about, in general, if you talk about the higher end of the market or even middle income students, uh, one is talking about even higher number going to private school. So, um, so the, the, and the third point is um, with regards to scalability and uh, the fact that um, they can scale faster and in a, and provide education in a cheaper fashion. So, when I last met with a representative from Gen, that was six seven months ago, um, they that we were just about launching a school in Kenya. We've, we've already, I believe, started expanding in Tanzania and Uganda. Last time I met with uh, Jay, there were seventy schools. They're now one hundred and thirty four. So. In terms of the scale, the private sector is far more hungrier. There's, there's far more of a motor for scale. Um, and based on research done by the World Bank itself, they found that it is, it is cheaper as well. Um, and the quality of care provided, um, education provided, is anywhere from 1.2, I'm not entirely sure how they came up with those numbers, but within 1.2 to 6.7 times better um, proportionally. Um, so considering all those factors, the, the piece about private sector's role in um, education in emerging markets in my mind and in the minds of uh, my organization, it's pretty clear that it is, it is very, very critical and that we are going to play a role in it um, by being a flexible financier um, for that sector. Which brings us to the strategy that we are trying to employ. Particularly, um, I, I run the education investment team for Africa. So speaking about Africa, our ambition is to be able to provide access to finance to everyone from small informal schools, which need fairly, we were talking earlier, it's $2,000, $3,000, to um, maybe gens and bridges of the world who might need hundreds of millions of dollars as they expand. Now, having said that, we ourselves as an institution can only directly fund up to a certain um, investment ticket, so on the lower end, about two odd million dollars. Um, that too specifically for, for Africa and other um, con um, continents or markets where we feel the need is dire and therefore we are willing to go down on our ticket size. Um, but in order to reach the other end of the market, which may not, be, which may not need that ki kind of capital, we are looking to work through intermediaries. We want to lend to banks so that they can on-lend um, and reach some of the smaller, um, less formal schools. Um, we want to possibly even invest in private equity funds who can then um, potentially invest in um, semi-formal um, education institutions which with an, an infusion of capital and governance can gen then go to the next level um, and possibly help um, address some of the demand that we're seeing. So in, in short, from, from my institution's perspective, um, education um, uh, is, is a sector where private uh, education is a field where private sector has a huge role to play and we want to see how we can be flexible enough as a financial institution to um, address their needs. So can I just ask you to clarify something for me? I, um, <coughs> when IFD makes a loan to a, a, a bank, for instance, to, so that the bank can lend on, um, do you, do you make the, because one of the problems that a lot of financial institutions have in lending to schools is that 
that very often, particularly when you start dealing with a very low economic uh, sector of any community, the, there is a tremendous amount of risk involved. So financial institutions do not want to lend or extend capital. So when IFC lends to a bank but with the specific mandate of lending on to empower schools, how do you structure that financing to make sure that the bank is incentivized to make these loans? That's a, that's a great question. So we have been trying to do this for a long time, and honestly, we have not been able to succeed to the extent that we would want to because of the, the reason that you mentioned. Um, so what we are trying to do, and we are, we are in the process of working on some pilot um, facilities right now, not in the education space yet, but in the healthcare space, um, where we are um, uh, trying to be innovative. Um, and for the first time, um, IFC is willing to bring in what we think of as even slightly concessional financing um, in order to appropriately incentivize the bank to lend. So, um, for example, um, we are talking to a bank, it's not yet been um, finalized, where um, if we, um, we will lend them a certain amount of money at a certain interest rate, and if they are able to reach um, the kind of market that we want them to reach, um, the kind of healthcare providers that we want them to reach, um, we will actually give them a discount on the interest rate that they owe us. Um, it, it won't be huge, but it will be in enough for them to, uh, to incentivize them. A and it will still, the whole proposition will be commercial for everybody concerned. Um, so to clarify, IFC only makes commercial investments, um, but specifically in the health and education sector, specifically in markets such as Africa, we are looking to bring in some amount of flexibility, some amount of structuring innovations to um, make it, to incentivize mainly the intermediaries better. Um, and other, other than just doing loans, we are also willing to do equity or quasi-equity financing as well. So you will do, because it's always, I mean, do, do, you, do you take an equity position in a, in a loan, like a first tier, so that it in then encourages other financial institutions? Right. And do you do this in local currency in whichever country that you're operating in? We, we are not able to do it in local currency in all the countries we're operating in, depending on the maturity of the financial markets in those countries. But in, in a lot of the countries in Africa, we are able to do local currency financing as well. Um, to answer your first question, if it is in the context of this, um, this lending to a bank and getting them to on lend, we are trying to work with partners to some sort of take that first risk or bring in uh, more um, of a grant kind of capital than IFC can. Um, again, this is all work in progress. Um, it's complicated. We are bringing multiple partners together. Fingers crossed, hopefully we'll succeed. But the aim is um, to try and address that problem that you were talking about. There is A, there is very high risk. B, banks can sit on their backside and still make a lot of money. Why do they, why, why do they need to go to the um, education sector? Why do they need to go lend to small little schools? So how do we incentivize them appropriately? What is the appropriate structure so that we are not distorting the market because we don't want to do that? Um, so considering all those factors, we are still trying to work with multiple partners, um, including some of the large donors in, in education and in healthcare, to come up with facilities which uh, could appropriately incentivize um, banks and lend to these institutions. Well, clearly IFC can make a huge contribution and can be really a leader in this field of being able to mobilize more access to capital through um, the, the poorer, low-cost pri private education sector. So we're glad to hear that IFC is getting very creative about we are this. We're trying. <laughs> I hope we succeed. We don't think we can do more. We, yeah. need, we need more longer-term funding in financial institutions and programs that actually can address this with the long-term nature of education. Education by its very nature is is the building of critical infrastructure that will, as you say, secure the future of a nation. So what well, today is possible in a, in a, in a year. Uh, if we do one school, uh, it takes us six to seven years to, to get our initial equity back. So if we put 100 into a single school, it takes us six to seven years to get that 100 back. That's on one school. Now, if you're trying to scale it 30, 40 schools, in our case, 30, 40 schools in the next couple of years, 50 schools a month, 
nonetheless, if, the, if you're still trying to scale your proposition, you need to find appropriate funding partners that share that similar long-term horizon. And we're not seeing enough of that yet. And, and I'm glad, and, and IFC has always been a leader, mm -hmm. but there needs to be more. And so that would certainly be one of the key avenues that we need to work on collectively to try and find the right kinds of funding partners and producers. Well, because to bring something to scale takes an enormous investment in infrastructure and in research and development. And I, having worked in the sector myself, I see the difficulty and the pushback um, by financiers um, about, well, when do we get to scale? And there are so many unknowns when you're dealing in so much of the developing world that it, it really is a, um, a, can be a very difficult uh, task. I mean, I was just going to say, I, mean, I, I, I forgot to say that if one school is taking six or seven years in our case, but you have to repay your loan obligations in five years, and that's a big syndicated facility. If one school is taking seven years that you need to repay in five, that's, that's, that's an inherent inconsistency that needs to be managed. Um, that being said, it is it's a nice school. It's, it's a very nice school. So what I'd like to suggest now is that um, we throw the floor open to, the, to questions. Um, so I think really what we're trying to look at here today is just what is the place of the private sector I in education? Um, and all of the different questions that we've considered here as uh, each of the panelists have talked are really very serious factors that um, belong to this discussion. So what I'd like now to do is to see uh, who among you would like to ask which of the panelists questions that answer your specific, um, and I think we should have somebody here maybe with the microphone or do we have? Yes, okay, so the gentleman over there. And if you could direct your question to uh, a certain panelist, it, it will help. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen and ladies. Um, uh, do you know, a uh, question is, is to Dino, and my dear friend. Um, if I understood your point correctly in the beginning, you said that um, healthcare, I think, is world faster in terms of privatization of different fields. If that is the case, what do you think was the trigger for that? And uh, how could we apply that to the education world, given that there is a lot of similarities in terms of the business model of both? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, just to reiterate my original point, I just think that uh, healthcare is a very, very close second in terms of the underlying fundamentals for education. So what triggered the acceleration of the growth of private sector in healthcare? It was the scale of the, uh, the, scale of the challenge. The scale of the challenge in healthcare was such that innovative new solutions were needed. Uh, I'm not a healthcare expert, maybe Bidhu can, can give better insight, but it's essentially the same fundamentals. Um, scale of the challenge. When, when a lot of what you need to do is driven out of necessity, the necessity to find a better education for families, people will step up. And typically private sector, when they see an opportunity, will step into that need to find a solution. Um, that's, that's all that I would really say on that. Hi, uh, the question uh, for Gabriel. Uh, Gabriel, you talked about uh, the PISA test. Uh, my question, how the private uh, schools or private sector uh, competed and will establish educational system or will performing system in the PISA test? If we are talking about Hong Kong, uh, talking about uh, North, uh, South Korea, Finland, what is the contribution of private sector we heard about? The how private sector improve the access and the quality of, of uh, the education system in developed countries. But what about the will develop and uh, uh, the, the contribution of the private sector? Can it compete? Can it add the value? Thank you. Yeah. Um, yes, in terms of PISA test, it is uh, to the extent that it's, it's on a global scale. Uh, so that's also including developed countries and uh, also including Finland and South Korea and, and countries like that. But in terms of the developed world, yes, certainly. Um, we've seen, I mean, in Pakistan and in India, you have a tremendous growth of low-fee private schooling. 
and randomized research has recently coming or coming out actually from America displays that these groups are much much more cost effective. Um, so yes, they have a significant. In terms of PISA, we don't know because they don't really participate in PISA. So we have to wait until these countries participate in PISA. But yes, there is a significant uh, uh, role to play there for the private sector. Now there is a caveat here, and that is that also in these places, specifically in Pakistan, as we know, is that um, these private schools often grow, or there's all, there's generally it's been on the primary school level this, the growth in the developing world. And what they've shown in Pakistan is that where there already is a secondary government school, the likelihood of private schools starting, a private primary school starting within the next couple of years is about three times higher. The argument is that these schools use female teachers who've been educated in the government secondary school. And that's why, partly why they can be so cheap, because about 90% of, of their costs are teacher salary. <laughs> um, so in some ways, they piggyback on previous government investments, but this is a perfect example of what public progress is, isn't it? Public private progress is. Uh, so we shouldn't, the evidence suggests that these schools can be very, very good. Uh, uh, in, in Pakistan especially, in India especially, uh, but, but we also have to recognize that there is a role there for the, for the government to ensure that this occurs in the first place. It might be, because what I understand is that the excursion into the secondary uh, uh, school market hasn't been as strong as in the private school market. So yes, I do, conclusion, I do think that there's a tremendous role to play for the private sector in the developing world, uh, uh, but I also think that we have to consider how to, uh, how to kind of facilitate that role. <clears throat> My question is uh, for Jay. Now this, yes, Jay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, this five dollars a month, I can't get it out of my mind yet. Yeah, well, <laughs> probably you need one year of this. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so is this number ex exclusive to Africa? Can you take this number somewhere else? That's my first question. <clears throat> my second question is, your market now is 50,000 students, correct? Our, our current network, yes. Yes. I think it can go up to 50 million students w w with these figures. Uh, why, how can you grow this? Do you franchise or do you, do you take your business yourself? Is uh, Dini signing an exclusive yeah, uh, contract? Yeah, that's a great example. <laughs> Sorry for the contract. <laughs> Um, so, uh, five dollars. It's our our, mar our price is determined by our desire to serve our customer base, so they earn less than two dollars a month. So it's both affordability, and then all the key uh, financial drivers that go into our cost base, which have to do with teacher salaries and land costs and construction costs and materials, etc. Um, we've found that in every market we've researched, both within Kenya and outside, that uh, the the variables of our customers' ability to afford. Uh, the cost of land, the cost of teacher salary, cost of land and construction, have a specific relationship that floats depending on the market. So we actually technically have five different price points in Kenya. We serve all customers who earn less than, uh, in Kenya, about a dollar, less than a dollar uh, a day. Um, but different regions have slightly different economics. And as we look, we're looking at expanding into India um, and uh, Nigeria, Uganda, and a few other countries. Um, the same variables hold. So the price might fluctuate, but we're always targeting uh, the families who are living on less than $2 a day. And so every place we've looked so far, that, uh, that relationship of affordability and our ability to provide the quality product has held. Um, I'm sure there are places where it might break, but we haven't seen it yet. Um, in terms of uh, the, the market size, yeah, I mean, our goal, our stated goal is 10 million people in low-income countries around the world. We think we can get there pretty quickly. Um, we're launching one new school every three calendar days. We doubled our enrollment in the last eight weeks. Um, we're growing into multiple countries by the beginning of next year. And so we move into a new country, we establish a, a, a headquarters there, and we build it out locally. I mean, we've grown from three to 1,800 employees in the last 48 months because of the size of the opportunity. So yes, we think that there's an enormous market. Um, we also know we're not going to be the only provider of education for 700 million children around the world. Um, so, but we're trying to reach as many as we can.
but uh, what is surprising to me is that I could not get the economics right of myself, the maths right. How? Uh, I'll explain that to you. 50,000 students, 130 schools. Translates to around 400 schools on an average. We charge $60 a year. That translates to 24,000 in, in, in revenue. Uh, if you have 20 teachers to one, that translates to 15 teachers and you, you have to pay at least 50% of your collection to, to the teachers. The teachers get on average $600 per annum. Then there are rent costs, there are other costs, then there are teachers training, there are exams, then there are mm, whole, whole host of things because I do quite similar thing in India. Uh, I will not get into the numbers part of that. <laughs> uh, but uh, So I, I guess the question is how do we do it? Is that right? Or, yeah, or, or, or am I making it up? <laughs> no, you, uh, no, I know you so have. So 80% 80 80 of, uh, of our operating costs are teacher salaries. That's correct. Um, we put more pupils in a classroom than you mentioned. And we drive all other costs out of, uh, uh, down through technology. So the only non-teaching staff at our academy is one person, our academy manager. Why is that possible? Normally, you'd have a bursar, a treasurer, an accountant, a collector, a treasurer. Um, we use technology. So all of our schools are cashless. No one pays cash at the school. Um, all of our payroll is done centrally and electronically processed. All of our teacher observations are done on a smartphone. All of our back end is handled through a central customer care center. So what we do is we take all of the available dollars invested into all the things that actually do make a difference for the education of our children. The teachers, their preparation, the curriculum, they're using the assessment, the monitoring, and everything else we automate, drive down the cost, and drive away. And yes, we're profitable. So I'll take that point, but just 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 a follow. What kind of infrastructure you have in your school? Uh, how big? What kind of infrastructure? What curriculum do you follow? So um, our schools are built very low cost, out of very low cost materials, but highly engineered to be um, comfortable learning environments. Um, we build school classrooms for less than twenty five hundred dollars per classroom, fully loaded. Um, Curriculum, we align to the national syllabus. So in Kenya, we are aligned to the Kenya national curriculum. We teach pre-primary and primary education. And the reality is the national syllabi for primary education around the world are not actually that different. I grew up in public school in New York, uh, and I know the same things that my counterparts in Kenya know for primary and middle school. Um, your third question, I can't remember. While you, while you plan to go to India, uh, and India being a day. <laughs> <laughs> 300 million children are asking for it. Unfortunately, I cater to 120,000 students as well. <laughs> uh, while you plan to go to India, and India being an unregulated uh, market, uh, how do you, how will you call yourself a, a, a company there? Because that's a, that's a big challenge. You have to operate in this, uh, this society, society format. So regulatory questions are a big, uh, big question for us as we look at new, uh, new countries. And certainly things in India like the RTE and other, other regulations are uh, something that we are currently looking very carefully at. But there are m hundreds of millions of children who do are at in our part of the market who are not getting access to high quality education, and we view that as a worthwhile risk. There are other markets we're looking at as well, and unfortunately, we're not going to be in a dozen countries next year, and so we do get to choose based upon the regulations, and so that's what we're looking at now. Thank you to the panelists for the insightful presentation. I'm also fascinated by the $5 per month thing. So my question is to Jay. At what level do you operate in the education system? Or is this $5 across, across? What level from in terms of what classes and what ages of children we teach? Mm. Is, that, is that your question? Yes, whether it's at primary or no. So or we teach pre-primary and primary. So we go from age three up to age 16. Okay. Um, the other question is to DG. I'm wondering how you walk around this high interest rate that the bank charges. If you're going to walk through the, the bank to, to earn length, the interest that you charge. Commercial. If we are going through the bank, um, so that's that's 
that's how we are um, hoping to reach them. And from what we have found is, is um, the, uh, it is not, um, it's less a challenge of the interest rate and more a challenge of the tenure. Um, most of the um, institutions, most of the private sector education institutions that we talk to, like whether it is high end like Dino or on much, much on the lower end side, they say that, look, we need a much more um, flexible tenure. We need some grace period. Um, and then we can, uh, because then if, if we are spreading the cash flow out of a, for a longer period of time, we'll be able to um, afford it. So that's what we are trying to address as opposed to artificially drive down um, the interest rate, which we can't do. But, but don't you think that uh, by doing that, by working through the banks, you will be eliminating the poorest of the poor? Not really. I mean, um, we cannot hope to address um, all the issues of the market. So you have the poorest of the poor um, where they may not have the money to even afford the fees to go to a private sector school. Um, so they may have to go to the government school. So that is why I feel that public sector still has a role to play, not for profit still have a role to play. Um, and then there are a huge segment, um, even then they're not certainly rich by any standard, they're not even middle class, but they do send their children to small informal schools in, in slums, um, to the, at the next level to schools like bridges and then and so on and so forth. That is the market we are trying to reach. Now the providers to that market are able to charge some fees and that fees could possibly include um, if you have a longish tenure, um, the ability to finance, ability to um, you know, take a bank loan for a significant tenure and then pay it back. So you're absolutely right. The poorest of the poor kids who cannot or their parents who cannot afford to pay anything at all, um, even we will not be able to reach through banks or, or any of, by investing in any of these for-profit entities. Part of it though is about scale. So you know, we, our customers are the, the poorest families in Central Manhattan, but we're not an individual small scale entity who would not be able to you know, a access a loan like that. By aggregation and by scale, there's a bigger opportunity to access capital that does ultimately flow through to serve the rich poorest population. So my last question is, um, do you only do your own school or you, there are possibilities of partnering with an existing school? Currently all of our schools are greenfield, but we are looking at the possibility of other models. Can I just say something? We long, the majority of our schools are long-term leases. Can I just say on the point that, yes, I mean, some teachers will always uh, find it difficult to attend private schools, whether it's in developed or the developing world. And I think, I mean, that's where the, the kind of essence of the private partner partnership can come in, which is to fund these pupils to attend the private schools. Yeah, Jay, I'd just like to ask you a question. You are saying that you're charging $5 a month for a tuition, is that correct, per child? Yeah, it includes, it includes all the supplement materials. Uh, and th which includes all the books and materials. But I don't know if you found in Kenya, you know, we talk about free government schools. I can tell you in Ghana that the government schools are most definitely not free. And the schools that I work in in Ghana, we're charging about the same, $5 a month, as what, well, we don't, the school owners are charging about that on an average. However, that's just about exactly what it costs to go to a government school because they have all sorts of exam fees, facilitation fees, different other fees, and that is even with the government giving a capitation grant to uh, government schools, to children that, uh, for the enrollment in government schools which they do not extend to the privately owned schools. So it's really, at least in Ghana, I can tell you a complete myth to talk about free government education. Well, uh, just to add on to that, one, um, we, we didn't discuss it now, but I'm sure the earlier panel possibly did, um, was about public-private partnerships. So exactly to reach that kind of market, we cannot afford the fees um, just by saying that you are going to provide free primary education through public sector, you may not reach it. Whereas if you, if the government pays uh, Bridge Academy $5, 
they would surely be a better place to um, achieve that or, or any other informal private schools. And I think also in the, in the private schools where there's very low fee private schools, there's often um, some community pressure because not every family has only one child. Um, a lot of families have several children in them and there's a tremendous amount of free scholarships that are given. Um, the first child and, and second child may be paid, but then after that you can't anymore. They can't afford to pay anything. So a lot of school owners will have quite a high percentage of children coming to their private school who pay nothing at all. Um, and that would not be possible in the government schools. Did we have any other questions? Yeah, I have a question for Jay. Uh, Jay, I just wanted to know, you take schools on lease model, but uh, what is your own CapEx per school which you set up? Can you say that one more time? Uh, what is the CapEx you do on your school when you take it on lease? So we lease the land and we build, we construct the school. And the school construction costs are around $2,500 per class of total day. So you build the school, uh, but the building is owned by you, but the land is leased. About 92% of our, our schools are long-term leased, but we always build and, oper uh, and own the schools. So. so what is the capacity of every school which you build? It, uh, in year one, it's about 300, and it scales up to about 1,000. I see a lot of people doing yeah, the math. What is the total <laughs> Calculators are easier. <laughs> and what is the margins of your schools? <laughs> Good enough to attract venture capital partners. <laughs> well, <coughs> excuse me, I think we're coming towards the end of the time here, but I think this has been a particularly interesting discussion <laughs> because this is a, a panel in which we've actually talked about real solutions, um, where you've heard some uh, great examples of, of practical market-driven solutions. Um, some of the ways in which IFC is now changing its policies to also look at how it's possible to finance its STEM degree through also through um, the GEMS Foundation, how they also are um, varying the, the way in which their foundation can extend their reach to instructional and learning materials. So I think it's very important that when we have these discussions on education that we really sort of stop all the lofty rhetoric and engage in these kinds of discussions which are re actually really talking about what is happening on the ground um, and how we really can do this rather than just talk about what we ought to do and what ought to be. Um, I'm sure that there are lots of gaps that we haven't covered in this discussion, um, but on, by the same token, I think there are a lot of linkages between what, every, what all the panelists have been speaking about. So I'd like to thank our panelists, um, thank the audience for a really uh, great interactive discussion. Um, and uh, I'll bid you good morning. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.